This is the Camp Baker Show. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Kev Baker, and that's right. You guessed it. It is time for today's Kev Baker Show right here on this network that you all absolutely love. Truth Frequency Radio, TFRlive.com. It's Tuesday night, and once a month on a Tuesday, that means only one thing. I get to join forces with, in my opinion, one of the UK's finest researchers, speakers, authors, Good friend, Mr. Ben Emlyn Jones. So tonight is going to be an absolute doozy, ladies and gentlemen. It's going to be awesome. So much to talk about. It really is. And also today, I had a very interesting and long overdue conversation with one of our brilliant listeners. And that is, of course, Nancy that we see in the chat room. I've not had time to nip in there tonight yet. But absolutely amazing to get to speak to Nancy. And I'm going to be doing a a lot more kind of Zoom stuff as well at weekends and thing for the Patreons out there. I've been talking about that before. And of course, Nancy, she's on Patreon. And I think this Sunday I'll be going live on there. So if you want to check that out, head on over to Patreon. And with that said, I hope tonight doesn't turn out as creepy as last night. Because last night we had guests on and there was some really strange stuff occurring as the show progressed. And then I'll be bringing that up with Ben later on in the show. But there's so much for us to get into before that. So with us getting right into it now, and I'm just looking here, latest news breaking on some of the things we're going to be speaking about tonight. For anyone out there who doesn't know who Ben Emlyn Jones is, he is the man behind the website that is dubbed Epanwo. And that's H-P-A-N-W-O, Hospital Porters Against the New World Order. Now, Ben talks about all the topics that we love to get to on here, and that is UFOs and uh, paranormal investigations, cryptozoology, hidden knowledge, forbidden history, archaeology, chemtrails, and tonight in particular, things that are flying around in the sky. So then, without further ado, let me bring Ben onto the show. How you doing, man? Hey, Kev, it's good to be back. How are you? Happy New Year to everybody, and to you, of course, especially. Well, a happy new year to you. And, you know, even the introduction there, you cover so many topics, Ben. It's quite hard for even somebody like me to wrap my head around. And that's why I think, you know, we join forces once once a month. And as well as being researchers, you know, we're really, really kind of interested in all of these stories that would be going on anyway. Even if you didn't have your website, even if I didn't have the radio show, And I think right now in the times we're living, all these kind of topics I listed off earlier on for that we always get into in this show and on your shows as well. So many more people gaining interest in this all the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I am pretty much a jack of all trades because I think all these things are connected. So I I don't specialize really in any particular subject because I find that I can build bridges and links between them that more easy because there is something definitely systemic about all these things and how they come together. That's definitely what I found. Absolutely. And in the UK, we're going to get right into it because there's been weird stories going on, shall I say. Yes, just over the festive period. And of course, we like to talk about UFOs, the old uh, things flying about in the sky. And literally, we have had two massive UFO stories, one occurring right before Christmas and one today, because there is something very unidentified that is flying around the skies right next to and into the vicinity of our two large airports here in the UK, Ben. And you know what? The official line, I don't know if I'm buying a minute of it. So what do you make of the whole drone fiasco that's going on right now? Oh, it's incredible. I mean, I, I first found out about this and I, and I immediately went in and um, started looking into it in depth. And I actually made four videos on her Panwo TV all about the Gatwick situation because we were told that um, one of the world's biggest airports in, um, and actually was shut down on the, one of the busiest days of the year, um, leaving 140,000 people trapped within the terminal buildings because some 
body, some fool, some some kid, or I don't know who, decided to fly a drone over the airport where the planes come in to land and take off. And, of course, the airport then said they couldn't risk these drones colliding with the aircraft and possibly causing a disaster. So they shut the airport down completely, and it was shut down for over two days. And um, the police were called in, all kinds of specialists with all kinds of equipment. They got the army in and everything. And they had special drone, anti-drone weapons, uh, electronic countermeasures, things like this. Uh, yet, for some reason, these uh, hobbyists with little drones managed to fool everybody. And no one knew exactly who they were. No one seemed to know where these drones were coming from, although it'd be quite a simple matter to follow them when they had to charge their batteries and things like that. But it kept the media kept repeating again and again and again, it's drones that caused this. Until uh, well, afterwards, they actually arrested a couple, a man and a woman in Crawley nearby, and um, they had no evidence against them, except that the man likes to fly drones as a hobby. That's the only evidence they had. They questioned him for thirty. They questioned them for thirty-six hours, then released them without charge. Uh, in the meantime, the media had a field day, calling them the the drone monsters of Gatwick Airport and things like that. It was ridiculous. Um, so obviously, th- the drones were a cover story. The question is, what were they a cover story for? And there are several different theories. There's several different strands of possibility here. One of those is, as you say, there were some strange things seen in the sky over the airport. In fact, a local man I got in touch with who um, had was been he drives around the area because he works in the area and he takes often takes drives around the perimeter roads in the earliest hours of the morning, said he'd spoken to several people who had seen strange lights appearing and disappearing in the low cloud above the airport. Because if you remember, Kevin, it was very cloudy in that part of the country. I know you live in Scotland, but for those who live in the area, we'll know we've had exceptionally low cloud, thick cloud over the last few weeks. Um, it's always cloudy uh, up here, Ben. Is it all oh, there too? <laughs> all right, so, no, yeah. so that was um, that is a possibility because, of course, in in Chicago, something similar happened a few years ago, where an air, a UFO appeared above an airport and that shut it down. There's several other possibilities as well. Now, the reason there's another possibility is actually is not as exciting, but it's unfortunately probably more likely is that there was some kind of breakdown of the air traffic control equipment. Now we know this, and well, we don't know it, but I suspect it because in Birmingham, just a couple of just literally a couple of hours after Gatwick reopened, they announced that they were shutting down too. Birmingham was shut down for a couple of hours as well because of some fault of the air traffic control system. Now, Birmingham were honest about it because it seems it it wasn't such a serious problem. It could be fixed within a couple of hours. Therefore, the passengers could get on their flights and they, because the flights wouldn't be seriously delayed, they wouldn't get any refunds or compensation. The situation at Gatwick, if it was a breakdown of the air traffic control, it was obviously a much more serious one. And there was a huge number of people there. There was the equivalent of the population of the town of Banbury in Oxfordshire stuck within this building. There were people coming into land and they couldn't disembark from the aircraft because the terminals were overcrowded. So they were just kept on the planes, just they had to sleep there. It was really bad. And um, th- now if if there had been a breakdown, all every single one of those passengers would have been owed a refund on their ticket and compensation for the inconvenience and for basically the uh, the, the mess up that the airport had carried out had committed and now that's a massive amount of money when you think about it and what i suspect happened was that the people in management at the airport decided i think you know we can't really afford this can we pull a fast one and just tell them it's a drone then it's kind of an act of god and we're not liable because it's not our fault some idiot decides to fly a drone over the airport this particular time and i think that's what they might well have done and you know what kev this is breaking news so somebody might have already seen it it was a couple of hours ago Heathrow Airport have now just announced that they're shutting down because of drones. Now, this is <laughs> I think they're not going to be honest like Birmingham was. I think they're going to take the same line as Gatwick did and they're going to lie about it. Now the question is, does anybody actually believe it? Because these drone these drone monsters were never caught. The police have even admitted, oh well, we we, we perhaps there never was a drone. You know, maybe we made a mistake after they you know, after spending thousands and thousands of pounds on specialist drone hunting equipment and drone hunting teams. It's it's a massive amount of taxpayers' money has been wasted. The passengers have been lied to. The airlines have collaborated with it. I actually visited the airport and, and had a look around, and they'll put people were sort of like hanging around, and they look really miserable. I felt sorry for them. I mean, it's, it's, it's an awful thing to happen. These people have been treated like dirt, if that's the case. But, I mean, hopefully no one will believe it this time. It looks, I think what's going to happen at Heathrow is they're just trying the same thing again. They're going to try and pull a fast one. They'll probably arrest someone in the local area as well because it's another London airport. There's lots of buildings around. There's lots of people who are like drone hobbyists that the police could drag in and question for a little while just to make it look like they're doing something when they're not. 
Yeah, this is a mass, whatever it was, whatever, whether it was UFOs or whether it was an, a systems breakdown with air traffic control. It's the drone story is nonsense from start to finish. And the, we, the people, including airline passengers, have been lied to quite arrogantly and blatantly by the authorities. And that should be a wake up call for all of us. There's, there's no honesty up there, mate. No honesty at all. No, absolutely, Ben. I, I'm with you. And um, there's other ways that we could look at it. We like to, you know, consider all possibilities here. And, and I'm not saying this meant anything at all or really means anything, but I remember maybe a week or so or in the weeks building up to Christmas, our defence secretary, he was on the media talking about the fact that we shouldn't go back to sleep and uh, feel secure now that ISIS are kind of being defeated because Al-Qaeda, they're back on the scene and they're planning more spectaculars, right? And of course, I'm not saying I believe that for one minute. That, that was the party line then. And then two weeks later, when you see something like this happening, Again, it doesn't mean anything, but one of the initial thoughts I had was, well, perhaps with it being that busy in there, if you were to start telling people that maybe there's a, some intelligence to suggest something was going to happen, that would cause major panic. And although they love to scare the bejesus out of us, you know, I really think sometimes when it's not a, con a kind of situation they control, Ben, like maybe they don't have any kind of un undercover agents or, or more likely MI6 aren't running them, then maybe they rather to err on the side of caution. And it's a good way to close the airspace if maybe there was, you know, we've heard about the use of drones and terror attacks before, perhaps yeah. the intelligence on that. So there's so many things that it could have been. But the one thing that I definitely think it wasn't is what they definitely told us. The official yeah. story just stinks, dude. It does. And this is um, there's a possibility what you just said, that it's something related to, to the terrorist situation. And, you know, they're taking advantage of it. There's no doubt that um, the people who want to curtail people's, you know, the, the, the public's ability to use these aircraft, they're taking advantage of it by suggesting that the drones should be licensed and, and there should be people should have to have criminal checks and they should have to, to go through some kind of vetting process before they're allowed to fly these aircraft. It's um, and I think there's obviously um, funny you should say that because it was um, just yesterday the police get us were handed new anti drone powers after the Gatwick disruption. And this is coming from The Guardian. And when I've done a quick news search, this is the the top story from yesterday when it comes to drones. And just a quick headline, kind of first paragraph here, Ben, it says police will be handed these extra powers after the mass disruption in Christmas. And uh, it says the Gatwick was reportedly forced to close, like you were saying, 1,000 flights grounded. And it says now that in response, the government has announced a package of measures which include plans to give the police the power to seize land, and search for drones. Well, there you so, are. See seizing land. And of course, even if it wasn't initially all set up for this exact reason, never let a good crisis go to waste. Mm. And the police are always wanting to expand their powers, aren't they? They are, they are taking every opportunity they can to, to introduce policies which would otherwise be very unpopular. They need an excuse. It's problem, reaction, solution, yeah. as David Icke says. And, you know, well, well, why should we trust the police? Because the, what have the police done? They've done absolutely nothing. They've collaborated with airport management in this deception and spent thousands and thousands of God how much money of taxpayers' money. They've wasted the police. They, the police have wasted police time. The police have wasted the army's time. The, the, the airport have wasted everybody's time. And, and all they've done is arrested two innocent people that they, they they dragged whose names they dragged through the mud in the media and then then released them uh, i'm glad to say that the couple involved are actually suing the police for wrongful arrest and they're suing the media for libel that and all i can say is every last penny i hope they yeah. can bleed them dry that was disgusting the way they were yeah. treated i mean some of the headlines ben i mean what was the one you brought up before the show to me to give the oh, listeners a taste oh, of yes. this, uh, this, this i think was the daily express are these the morons who ruined our christmas I mean, that's it. I mean, that's hardly unbiased, is it? I mean, these are exactly. people who have simply been arrested. Their names were immediately leaked to the media. Um, there, there were, every newspaper actually had them. The BBC website just said it was a local man and a woman. But um, the, uh, every other newspaper published their names, published their photographs. I mean, they, they, they knew the police should knew immediately that these, this was innocent because the man's boss phoned up and said, no, no, he's been at work. He didn't do this. He's got an alibi. You but know, they still question him for 36 hours. Exactly. And you look at the response, right? I mean, we've had the police, and then there was at one point they were drafting in army snipers, stuff like all of this. 
I remember reading a long time ago when these drones really started to become commercial and popular that there was like RF blocking technology out there anyway. And oh, yeah. these things got to no fly zones, i.e. airports, they just wouldn't be able to fly in there anyway, so they kept things safe that way. So what happened to all the talk of, of that when that was going on? I, I don't this it's like they the what they had before is not good enough but but they're not explaining exactly why it wasn't good enough because you know these are um these aren't like the raptors which the US Air Force have these are just things you can buy i mean they the drones could be very sophisticated but you know they're no match for um serious government hardware when it comes to electronic countermeasures um and but of course they're electrically there. powered they're also electrically powered yeah and you've they're, been down there right you, you hmm. say you kind of been at that airport i've never been at that one myself See the surrounding area, Ben, <clears throat> and I bring this up. I mean, would people in like surrounding flats or houses be able to see if it was a more major kind of thing going on in the sky, the UFO kind of event that maybe some people are, are speculating it could be as well? Well, there's a, there's a large towns nearby. There's a, the, the airport is right next to a, a town called Hawley, which is like um, it's quite densely populated. And um, I did ask a couple of people, and they, they said they hadn't seen anything strange. And I kept an eye up in the sky, too. But um, there is a photograph which has been confirmed to have been taken at Gatwick Airport. It appears to show some kind of light in the sky. Unfortunately, there's, been, there's no better footage of it. Um, but, I mean, the very fact is that sometimes these things do appear above airports, these UFOs, and sometimes they do cause disruption. At the O'Hare Airport in Chicago a few years ago, the airport something quite similar the airport was shut down i mean there was several photographs of the lots of like a structured craft in daylight above the airport luckily the sky was quite clear so it was fairly visible what but, no chemtrails no chemtrails what was it? <laughs> you know Kev, the, the big problem is i mean there's really literally no way to see the sky properly um during this period because um there's been a lot of low cloud i think from right through the week before christmas all through the christmas period it's been low cloud very little wind. It's been pretty boring weather, actually, to be honest. And um, storm up here the past couple of days. It's been windy, yeah. windy, man. Oh, I hope <laughs> anything's better than what we got now. <laughs> but you know, basically, it's not been possible for people to see much of the sky. So if people see this. They seen strange lights above the, the airport. Um, and this guy I met, he he sounded. He said that people sounded quite positive. Well, we don't know any more than that at present. But there is this photograph which may or may not be genuine. But as it's a possibility that that was what caused all this. That's a, yeah, is a here's, possibility. Here's a novel idea, right? See how people, activists, phone up the police sometimes and they report the fact that we're being sprayed from the skies. Wouldn't it be refreshing if we seen the police and the response, the way that we see the response for a drone? The police rush in, they ground all the planes and they immediately investigate the claims of the public who, who are saying there's been crimes committed in our skies. Not ones that we need to guess about, ones that everyone can see every day. See the big light p lines of poison, officer? Yeah, those things up there. Any chance you could find out what's going on? And they laugh at people who say that. And I know it sounds like I'm making a joke of it, Ben, but, you know, there's a powerful message in there. If they were doing their right job, and I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying all cops are bad, because this is part of the agenda. This goes above them. They're being used as yeah. well. Y you know, if they were to do their job right, what a better place the world would be. Yeah, I know what you mean. And it'd be, it'd be nice, hopefully we may see that one day. We may see them, them actually going to airports, arresting people behind the, the geoengineering program and everyone else like that. That's what I really, really hope to see one day, Kev, because I'm tired of being lied to. I'm tired of being treated with this contempt. I try, I'm tired of, be, of having an elite in this world that treats me and, and my species like, a farm, like farm animals. And um, I want to put an end to it. Yeah, worse than farm animals. Yeah. Really. Absolutely. And, you know, we can't really give you the definitive answer, folks, what's going on in the skies around Gatwick and more recently, <clears throat> the past few hours, Heathrow. But we'll stay on top of that story. But the thing is, and the weird synchronistic thing is, this isn't really the same or the one and only kind of story about the sky that we're going to get into tonight. Because we also had a very interesting event occur over on the other side of the pond, where above the skies of New York City, we had a very, very interesting light show indeed, Ben, didn't we? And yeah. the internet, well, pardon the pun, it lit the internet up. Yeah, this was quite intriguing, actually. This happened just after Christmas, actually, between Christmas and the New Year. It began the day after Boxing Day um, at 9pm in New York time, which is like a bit later our time. But um, 
there are many, many photographs, there's many, many images, um, which shows a bright blue light above New York City, this very, very highly populated area. <clears throat> now, the media immediately announced it was caused by an explosion at an electrical power plant in the Queens borough. This is, um, but this has caused a massive blackout in the area, and LaGuardia Airport nearby had to switch to emergency power. Numerous flights were cancelled. It was very Gatwick-like, actually. Now, uh, there's been a few fake UFO photos connected with that, uh, which which are actually fake. I, at the moment, the I've got no real reason to disbelieve the official story, and that is that the power station, there was a power station called the Astoria plant, which is run by a company called Consolidated Edison Inc. And um, there seems there was some, some massive um, just electrical shortage there, which luckily no one was hurt. There was no real damage done. Um, so... I mean, I know there was another event in Louisiana, which is hundreds of miles away at the same time, which seems to not to have an ex- such an explanation. But at the moment, I have no serious reason to doubt the official story, quite frankly. And I know a lot of uh, people on my side of the fence might not like me, like to hear me say that, but I'm just being honest. However, same, good, same here. Yeah. You know, I, I would love to kind of hype things up and go down the whole. Oh, it could be the the Project Blue Beam would be the easy one to go for when the skies are going that kind of hue, that nice blue color. But um, I'm like you, and I, and I really see no reason to doubt what we were told. And if you look at the footage, the initial footage, it's important to really try and get the initial stuff that's oh, out yeah. quick after it, because then there's not really much time to manipulate it. And, you know, that's the world we live in now, folks. Everything near enough can be manipulated, so you don't really know what's real and what's not. But the initial ones, Ben, it did look like just what they were telling us. And there was, like, blue lens flares coming up from the bright light source, which could have been misconstrued as coming down from the sky, but I'm definitely quite confident. But like you say, one in Louisiana as well, and there wasn't quite as much coverage of that probably to do with the probably populations of the two areas, not as dramatic looking down there either. And then there was other videos, as always happens when there's floods and hurricanes and everything else that goes on. People just jump on the trend and, you know, after a while it becomes hard to know what's real and what's not. But definitely two strange events. And coming so close after the Gatwick event, you know, that, that's two weird things in the sky, and who knows what's going on, dude. It, it did make you wonder. I mean, and also, um, strange lights in the sky uh, do appear at, in other locations where there is no obvious explanation. And one of them actually happened near me, actually. Um, this was a few months earlier, in April. And um, a blue light appeared in the sky over northern and eastern Oxfordshire. And there's been several attempts to explain it but none of them really make any sense um, a number of people saw it including some people i know there's a photograph in bicester which is a, a town to the northeast of oxford um i couldn't see it from where i am it wasn't visible from oxford city but um i, I know it was visible for many areas around high wickham and that that location and there are several things that might cause this for example um, you mentioned project blue beam but there's also things such as harp chemtrails ufos and maybe an effect of cosmic radiation and the earth's magnetic field it may be something related to that and you know me being you know into my particle colliders brookhaven labs and the rec particle accelerator the relatively heavy ion collider that's near you that's near new york isn't it yes exactly so i mean you know with me always talking about cern and things i think we should throw that into the mix you never know what kind of things they're doing there either Exactly. And it's a little bit of, there's a little aside here from this story, which is quite interesting. And this is that um, the New York Police Department, when this event in New York happened, actually put out a tweet which uh, was intended to reassure the public. And it said, talked about the explosion at the power station, said there was no one hurt or injured. And then it said, there's no evidence of extraterrestrial activity in this. You know, I really, you know, I like <laughs> a bit more, but it, you know what the kind of icing on the cake was? It was the fact they used the alien emoji head three times <laughs> in the tweet as well. How cool, how trendy by the police. But two ways of looking at that, right? Nice way of having a little laugh about it. But of course, you, you know, are they seeding the minds of the population for some future alien contact? Oh, it's the way my mind works, you know, and, you know, although it could be a joke, absolutely. But it's also in our subconscious and it's in our conscious minds right now. Well, this is one way to look at it. It may be what you say. Another reason is maybe we should gain encouragement from this is that um, because the idea of extraterrestrial activity is at the forefront of, the, of everyone's mind, they still feel obliged to say so. When, you you know, a few years ago, they might have thought, well, we don't have to put that in because doesn't it go without saying it's not extraterrestrial? 
See, this is why so that's, like, a good, that's good news, Kev. Uh, it's <coughs> working with you, Ben. It's like we do shows and we should call them like Ben and Kev 360 because we don't give anyone any definitive answer. And these open-ended stories are the best ones to discuss because so many different angles that we can come at it from. And I'm sure with all the listeners out there, right, it's hard to really please everyone any of the time when you do this kind of work. But there's always something that somebody can resonate with. And that's why I think you all love it when Ben Emlyn Jones comes on. We'll be back after the break because there's even more going on in the skies and in orbit. Oh yeah, we'll be right back. Don't any This is the Camp Baker Show. Jones is on the Kev Baker Show hanging with me tonight. Before the break, we were talking about the drones over the UK. And then we were talking about the strange lights that were seen over New York, Louisiana, other places. Ben was getting into a strange light that was even close to him over here in the UK. And we're going to keep looking upwards. And it's so important to look up in the skies. And my son, Kev, uh, Kevin, he often makes fun of me, even when we're going to the local shop, because you can guarantee Ben... Most of the time on the way there, I know it's kind of dangerous, but I'm always looking up, dude, especially on the rare occasion that it's a nice clear sky. You never know what you're going to see up there. And so many people still, they don't notice what's going on in the skies above them. And there's so much more. It's so much more active. I don't know if it's otherworldly or from, you know, our secret programs, which we can definitely get into in just a moment, down to the chemtrails that we see as well. And it might make us look like a couple of dreamers, but it's important to always look up, isn't it, dude? Yeah, I mean, very, very few people do, actually. It's a, it's a, a shame, but I think um, uh, most people, actually, you survey, so they, they never do look up at the sky. It's like uh, it's just something that happens to be above their head where the sun is. But there's so much up there. Um, like I said, there's some very nice things, even, not necessarily mysterious things, but there's some there's some nice things to look at, some beautiful things, and also some things that, um, of course, are sinister and we need to learn about, um, whether it's extraterrestrial in terms of geoengineering. So um, I, I look up, as the saying goes. There's a website called lookup.org, which uh, deals with the chemtrail issue. And if nothing else, right, even if you don't believe in half the stuff that myself and Ben get into most of the time, then at least it gets people's faces out of their phones, Ben, doesn't oh, yeah. it? They actually, <laughs> yes. They disconnect from that. But we're definitely going to be looking upwards now because one of the biggest stories, definitely, that has happened in recent times since we last spoke has got to be the Chinese successful mission to the far side of the moon and their rover touching down. And this has been the kind of latest stage of their space kind of mission, which has been going for some time now. What's your thoughts on all of this, Ben? Because we often talk about Apollo, and now we have to talk about the Chinese getting to the moon. Yeah, China seems to be the most successful uh, nation in space at the moment. Um, things have changed an awful lot, but they have achieved something really remarkable. The land they, This is the second time they've actually landed an unmanned craft on the moon. This is unique, though, because for the first time ever, there's been a soft landing on the dark side of the moon, so-called, which is actually not dark. It's just it's called dark because it's basically unseen and so it's not literally dark. It actually receives just as much sunlight as the near side, uh, just at different times. It even has phases, but these are uh, these phases are opposite to the ones we see on Earth. So they, there is plenty of sunlight there. So I know some people are saying, well, it has to be fake because the sun's shining. And I said, you have to explain. no, it has actually the far side of the moon. Because the, the, the moon way, always uh, is the best way to kill that conversation is ask them to imagine a, a solar eclipse uh, <laughs> yes. when that moon fits perfectly in front of the sun. And I mean perfectly in front of it to the point where it's beyond coincidence, just saying, but where do you think the sunlight's hitting at that point? And usually, and it should, kill that conversation dead. Yeah, I mean, I'm really fascinated by this because, of course, the moon is one of the most remarkable objects in the universe, and it's the closest object to the Earth. Yeah. Um, it's a... Uh, Exactly, and this is, and it's actually the the this area where these craft has landed. And I've got no reason to think there's not a real space mission there. Incidentally, I'm not doubting seriously that they have landed a craft there. But the um, well, we both agreed. We talked about it beforehand, didn't we? Because we were all quite excited about this story. Being a couple of you know, like to talk about the moon on both our shows we do together and separate shows, right? And you know, you can go back to the Apollo times when there was the space race against the Soviets. And there was kind of a vested interest there to make sure that they were first and they didn't show anything that would have had a really negative kind of 
the effect on the public, i.e. something going wrong. So that's what's led to all the kind of, was it real, was it not? But nowadays, I don't really think the Chinese have got much to gain about lying. There's no kind of financial onus on them to get there first. Or, you know, they don't need to save face. And like you say, their space industry, along with countries like India and Pakistan, and I think it's India, very, very successful. And when you compare them to NASA, well, at least they're moving forward. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is like I said, it's, there's no astronauts on this craft. If anything, if there's a disaster, it's sad when they lose the spacecraft, but you know, no one gets hurt. So I, I think this is this is probably a real craft, and it's landed in this area which is completely out of sight from the Earth, and and, and you can't get radio signals direct. So there has to be a relay craft, which is actually um, in a place called the Lagrange point, which is between the Earth and the and the Moon, where both. You could actually, it can actually transmit and relays the signal back to Earth. Um, now, um, what's interesting is that the dark side or the far side or the back side of the moon, whichever term you use, the side facing away from the Earth, is a very unusual place because it's one of the few places in the entire universe that is completely invisible from the Earth for another reason than just sheer distance. And not only that, not only is it invisible, it's very close and it's very large. 7.3 million square miles of land, which is basically right next door to the Earth, and it can't be seen from the ground, which means it's the ideal place to operate a space. But if you were an alien coming to examine the Earth, it's the perfect place to put a base where you can like access the Earth very easily and quickly without being seen from the surface. It's also the best place to locate a secret space probe program now we're talking ben now we're talking absolutely and this comes on to um a very very interesting pair of interviews from two people uh, donna Hare and sergeant carl wolf now these were two uh, contractors to nasa in the 1960s who talked about how they were involved in photographic they were basically uh i'm not sure what donna Hare's role but wolf was an engineer and he was used to work on um, electronics and uh, photography equipment he was actually in the u.s air force he was loaned to nasa and the national security agency as well so he moved around quite a lot and he said he was in the laboratories and the photographs were coming in from the spacecraft and being processed and developed and he actually got to see a couple of photographs that were before they were published in the media and he was in there and he was talking with the technician that was in there and they said well we found a base there we found a base on the moon this was on the dark side of the moon away from the earth and he describes them there were spherical buildings there were dome-shaped buildings there were all kinds of definitely artificial structures on the moon and what they were doing at nasa was basically they were editing the photographs to remove those those images, those bases. They were airbrushing them over. They were cutting them out. They were refitting the photographs together. Uh, and then these would then be released to the media. Now, Carl Wolford, he was uh, quite uh, – he only found out this later because he, he was going home expecting to see on the TV how they found bases. And he was very disappointed when he found out they, they weren't going to publish that. So uh, the question is if, if the Chinese space agency had managed to carry out the first soft landing – on the far side of the moon, will they encounter these bases, these secret bases, and whoever or whatever lives there? And if they do, will they tell us? That's the question. Oh, absolutely, Ben. Very intriguing. And, you know, if we factor in another, perhaps another piece of this puzzle, certainly something we have to bring up here, Gary McKinnon. And yeah. he claimed back in the day when he, not, I'm not going to say hacked into the Pentagon and NASA computers, when he gained access, because there was no password on them, right? Yeah. And he claims he's seen documents and files that pertained to on-world and, or terrestrial and non-terrestrial officers. And there was transfers between craft ships that weren't on any manifest on this planet, right? Yes. Now, if we think, or if we go with that, and I've no reason to doubt what Gary was saying, then, you know, there's got to be somewhere where these ships and these transfers are taking place, right? And if it was down here on Earth, you would imagine that eventually somebody would see something. Mm. So what a perfect place, like you say, for some kind of outpost. And perfect sense from a military point of view. You know, are we ever going to get to go up there and see the far side of the moon? No, we're not. So, yeah, absolutely, I'm open to that idea. And like you say, will the Chinese be the ones? And when it comes to space and this new world order, Ben, of course, there's no difference between the countries, even what it may appear like on the surface. And maybe the Chinese, and a lot of people think they're going to be the head of this new world order, 
what an event for them maybe to reveal something. Give us a little peek behind the curtain at what these governments know. Well, I'd hope so. I mean, I obviously that's what I'm hoping for, my, but it's unlikely to be honest. I know. It's, very it's nice to dream, right? Uh, yes, yeah. exactly. The we, me. Yeah. It is possible, Kev, you see. I mean, we, we, I may be wrong. It may be possible. The thing about it is that um, these space agencies, such as China, like you said, they're different nations, they're sovereign states, but they are still un- influenced to a greater or lesser degree by the globalists, by the New World Order conspiracy. Uh, and <coughs> oh, if this was to happen, right, this, would, what, this is what we would call a disclosure event. Yes. It just happens that you're a bit of a, an expert on disclosure events, in my opinion, because you wrote not one not two, but three books about this kind of thing. So I think you're best pl- or well-placed to speak to this kind of scenario. Yeah, I, I think so. I really, really am a bit of an anorak when it comes to this sort of thing. And my books are um, novels. They're fictional, but they're a, a fictional scenario of what would happen if. Is That's that's the question. The, the, the very thing we're discussing now. What if we suddenly found out that there were aliens and, and everyone admitted it and the government admitted that's what my books are about it's a fictional scenario that would happen in that case and that's so that's why i've had to think so much about this question kev i really have to write those books and to, to be honest it's, it is unlikely it's a long shot it's possible but th- this is a question that's gone back throughout the history of space exploration because there's, there's never been just a single country doing it in fact um it began with the soviet union with the with the, with the launch of sputnik closely followed by the americans and there was in the first uh, decade of the space race particularly there was a huge ro- surface on the surface anyway there was a rivalry between the ussr and the usa uh, to get various things done first and um and of course the question this question of independence uh, of the space agencies goes right back to that period because anyone who looked at the situation would say well obviously if the if the soviets spotted the americans faking anything they would immediately blow the whistle they'd immediately publicize it and vice versa but unfortunately that's not the case it's it turns out that underneath the surface underneath all the publicity the uh, the space race was actually very very different. The 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 Soviets and the Americans weren't just c- competitors and rivals on the surface. Under the surface, they were collaborators and they were uh, they colluded over very very many things. There's a very very interesting series of books by Anthony Sutton which uh, reveals this on a very very you know, all kinds of levels that the uh, the Russians and the Americans were basically working together on various projects. And one of those could well be the very secrets we're talking about now, and which is just exactly why they it's possible China even if they do spot some strange things which i'm sure they will since they got some they've been had up craft orbiting now for three weeks regularly passing over the dark side of the moon but they probably will not say anything i mean we don't know but str- strange thing is um just a couple of weeks ago in fact just about when the Chang'e 4 spacecraft first went into orbit around the moon carl wolf died um it was a tragic accident apparently he was killed um when he was uh, riding his bike which happens all the time unfortunately okay so so wait a minute so some previous whistleblower uh, about cases and things on the back of the moon in the same kind of time period the same window of time as the chinese about to go up there just happens to have a tragic accident yeah um it's, it's very very odd i mean it could be it could be just bad luck, but we don't. I just can't help wondering if there's a connection. I just can't help wondering. And of course, it doesn't prove anything, right? These series of events happening, you know, in close proximity, but it does make you wonder, like Ben says. But, you know, perhaps we're missing the, what the real true purpose of this mission is. And I think if we got to see real footage of what was going on up there, not that we're not seeing 100% real footage right now, but I reckon they're installing CCTV cameras. Just getting ready for building a social credit system before the first astronauts from China get up there, Ben. Oh, of course, yes. <laughs> I mean, oh, the, the, the Chinese, I mean, it's incredible. They're, they're, they're big brothers, that's technology they're using now. And they're quite open about it. And they've gone a lot further than any other country. And they've got almost a quarter of the people in the world living in China. So uh, they're, they're well in there. 
if whatever happens there will happen everywhere else, it'll influence the rest of the world. But I mean, they do, they have a manned space mission, but it's, they've got, they've had several space stations, which have quite short lived. They tend to crash down onto the earth. Luckily they haven't landed on anyone's head yet. Yeah, there was one uh, not that long ago, wasn't there? It was like mm. heaven in the sky or something, some weird kind of name when you try. I was a bit worried actually, because it had a nuclear reactor. It was nuclear, it had a nuclear power plant on board. So, uh, I imagine, I mean, it's just like Russian roulette, right? Or Chinese roulette where that's going to hit the planet when these things come down. Well, that's a bit worrying, yeah, because we yeah. weren't sure at first. So, uh, whatever, so there, we don't know what's exactly what role China is actually playing with space at the moment. But it's obvious they are, with America basically grounded now. I mean, um, America has given up its manned space program after all those years with the last space shuttle flight. Now, basically, the Russians are handling the ISS. They're doing, and then there's, there's, there's the private sector, Elon Musk, and people like that. Who are, who are quite successful, actually. So the whole situation has changed now. Between the only st- the only major state actors are Russia and China, and then you have these um, the, the NASA is basically falling behind, and you have like these private people coming up. The question is though, pri- you see, private again. We've got to ask this question. We ask how independent is the Chinese space agency, but how independent are companies like spacex because elon musk has been interviewed a couple of times and um on the rich planet show um there's there's a program about this it appears he's 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 holding things back i mean there's he's the way he behaves indicates he has a secret as an ex as an ex satellite communicator from the british army i imagine and i don't know if this is the case right but he probably has had to sign some kind of um secrecy kind of act or the equivalent over in the US because they have delivered payloads for the, the US military, stuff like that. So like you say, he must have been read in, not to everything, but as a because of the compartmentalization, I would imagine he probably is under some kind of he's probably been told some of it because he probably sees some of it and delivers some of it up there now, Ben. Oh, undoubtedly. I mean, the International Space Station does have a military contingent there. It has military role, and they have there is classified material going on there, probably relating to intelligence gathering on yep. on the Earth, and um, indeed, the equipment that um, uh, Elon Musk and his company delivers is probably relates to that. And I imagine he he well, he is a government contract. He does have government contracts, and um, he uses government facilities to launch his craft. So yeah, definitely. And um, the same would go for Richard Branson, who is yep. um, he's, right. a, he's a small player compared to Musk, but he's his Virgin Galactic spacecraft is back in the air after t- he had a terrible accident a few years ago and has been grounded, but it's back in the air. Yeah, you think about it as well, Ben. I mean, if we had a really really secret kind of thing that we were wanting to put up over here. I mean, you wouldn't be going to one of these outside companies. And in the UK, compared to the, the Air Force, now that all the money's been pulled out, the armed forces, I imagine Richard Branson's about the only game in town, right? Yeah, oh, well, over here, yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. it's, this is the space program is being basically, is being, in a sense, the military industrial complex complex that Eisenhower warned us about. It's much more diverse now than it used to be. It's not just state actors. It is uh, these very civilian contractors and p- private individuals and companies and, co- and uh, coalitions and, and, and cartels. Of course, you've got even Space Force over in America. Yeah, now this is that was an interesting thing. We discussed this on a previous show, and I thought it was very, very interesting that Trump happened to come out and start talking about he's going to establish a U.S. space force. It's quite funny because there was lots of um, there was all sorts of humor on the internet over that with pictures of Trump dressed as Darth Vader and things like that. <laughs> it's very, very amusing. It's it's like Rod Joseph, he's so easy to put into a meme. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I know. It was, it was everyone had a great amount of fun with it, but of course this is. Um, this is obviously that we're going to see the, what was it Carol Rosen said the ve- the weaponization of space. She was quoting uh, um, von Braun, Werner von Braun, her friend who is, was a Nazi rocket scientist who actually he died in 1977 and before he died he told her you must stop the weaponization of space and he actually told her back then that the Cold War would be over within a decade and it would be replaced by other things and he said that one of them would be terrorist states but this would be followed by the last card which would be the alien invasion and a space force or and indeed the the, the weaponization of space as we've seen I and mean, indeed the spy satellites and military satellites involving uh, with lasers and missiles and things it could be a part of that. It could be whether whether it's real or fake. Probably fake. The alien threat could be the ultimate in problem reaction solution. 
uh, to bring in a d- dictatorial one world government. Because if we've got to face, as Ronald Reagan said, if we're facing a threat from outside this world, how quickly our worldly differences will for- be put aside? Do you, remember, do you remember Independence Day, the film Independence Day? Oh, absolutely, Ben, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's not a very good film, actually. It's pretty awful, but it's, it's quite interesting. There are several scenes. For example, you see um, two aircraft taking off from, a, from an airbase in the desert. One's flying the Israeli flag and one is flying the um, Iraqi flag. And they are both together on the runway. It's obvious they are working in coalition to fight this alien threat. So two deadly enemies have come together and united, put aside their worldly differences, and united into, to, into a single force to beat this alien threat. And everyone thought something would happen in the London Olympics in 2012. And I really was, I mean, I was, I never went to there because I thought something might happen. I knew people in the area were moving out to, to get, get away for a couple of weeks while this was on. But nothing happened, probably because a lot of people were talking about it, I think. But um, they, they might try again, Kev. We may see this thing come up, come up again. I've always said, you know, it'd be not that this lends any credence to again, but one effective way to really, like you say there, like you perfectly laid out, to bring everyone together. We always talk about it, problem, reaction, solution. You you want to have a, a global government? Well, to bring everyone around the globe together, you need to think gro- global crisis. And something like this, Ben, fake or real, and we're talking more about the fact they would maybe pull it off here, Absolutely, dude. What a perfect way. I mean, what other ways really are there that would be as effective as making everyone pull together? Yeah. Well, all the others have failed, haven't they? I mean, 9-11 was supposed to start the, the world war. It didn't work. Well, it been- caused people to question their faith as well, which would help to bring in a one world religion on the back yeah. of this. Exactly. So if, if 9-11 didn't work and, and, and these other things didn't work, they're going to have to start. They, I mean, they're going to start getting more desperate and, and more willing to double or quits with something much, much bigger. The, what we have to do is like when they roll this dice, we've got to be ready and, and take a step back and think, hang on, what's really going on here? Look is the, this what it appears to be? Yeah, exactly. From Independence Day to an unmentionable number of other movies, books, you name it, the programming for the eventuality that this would be the case, some kind of otherworldly beings. Again, just things turning up in the sky, whether they're fake or real is really irrelevant at that point, Ben, isn't it? I mean, so yeah. They have been programmed. But... I actually watched the uh, the sequel, Independence Day 2. Um, yes, I, I need a girlfriend. I really do. It's um, it was just as bad. It was just as awful. But it was what's interesting about it is that it, it essentially talks about a future world the, after the original Independence Day scenario. A few years later, the U.S. president is a uh, someone, a woman who is a very, very transparent parody of Hillary Clinton. And basically, the aliens are coming back again, but they've managed to sort of borrow some of the alien technology and turn them into vehicles and weapons. It's it's very interesting. And um, I kind of wondering if there may be some kind of two-stage solution to that sort of thing. Who honestly knows, Ben? Now, we've got a couple of minutes before the break. I see Johnny Whistles is in the chat room. I knew Johnny would be hey, along Johnny. With, yeah, with Ben. He'll be on in the second hour with us. So that'll be great to bring John onto the show. And we mentioned your books there during that segment. Three books out and you've got the latest one. It's just really, in the past couple of episodes, you've released that, right? I have. In fact, it was like in early December, I released the third and final part of the Roswell trilogy. But is it really the third and final part? Because, I mean, now, right, we could have a scenario where you maybe talk about the the factual Chinese mission to the moons thus far, and then you give it that Ben Emlyn Jones spin. <laughs> well, you never know. I mean, I've, I've always... I've always got ideas in fact i've got other ideas for new stories and going around at the moment so i'm toying with other ideas but i mean that is the definitely the end of this particular series of books um it was i enjoyed writing them enormously in fact it was quite sad when i finished because i had to sort of say goodbye to all these imaginary friends that I'd, i'd made up over the years and anyone who writes fiction will know what i'm talking about but the characters in my books i had to sort of say goodbye to them and everything but they the story is is basically about this. It's about what would happen if <coughs> if we were given 
if we did end up with UFO truth somehow through some process, we ended up with UFO truth instead of UFO lies. How how would the world be different? And I had to conjure up a kind of alternative history scenario in in my head, which I then which then became this story, um, which is now run into an entire trilogy. So there's like three books. Um, Roswell Rising, a novel of disclosure Roswell Revealed, a world after disclosure and Roswell Redeemed Humanity after disclosure and if you, if you like UFOs and Roswell and exopolitics and crash retrievals and free energy and all these sorts of things you will love these books, they really are the kind of books which may well echo a lot of your own thoughts and a lot of your own speculation about a possible other world or future world that we could have Oh, Absolutely, and you know I think myself included we think so much about when will they turn up, you know, when are when are they going to show up? And I think we need to spin that round. It's probably when are we going to grow up? Yes. When are we going to bring about disclosure? Because as opposed to us waiting for them, they're probably waiting for us, Ben. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it is our decision. I mean, this was something that came out in the books very much. It was not, it's not an alien initiated thing. They're not our saviors that are going to come down and rescue us like knights on the shining armor. We got to do this ourselves. I mean, whatever is going through their heads, if they have heads, whatever they're sort of, they use for thinking that they're not, they're not going to land on the white house lawn. It's, it's down to us. And this is, um, so this is something that uh, I've had to think about an awful lot, but if anyone, if any listeners want them, you can get them on all, Good bookshops, Amazon, just put in Roswell Rising, put in my name, you'll find them. Um, there's links on my website as well. So do check them out. They're good gifts if you're thinking of any New Year's presents for anybody. And um, like I said, if you like this sort of subject, you like the UFO subject, I think you'll enjoy these books. Absolutely. And after the break, I'm going to be asking Ben about the UFO subject in the UK. I think out of all the shows we've always done over the years, ladies and gentlemen, not one has gone by where I don't find an excuse to ask Ben about our favourite subject, Rendlesham Forest. And of course, there's been something new in the media about Rendlesham Forest that we're going to get into after the break. And I've held this for Johnny Whistles coming on because that's his favourite UFO case. It really is. And we can get into what's been happening just recently. Of course, ahead of the release of the amazing documentary that's coming out, Capel Hill coming out very very soon that's one hour down one hour to go can't believe it where does the time go that's because I've got Ben Emlyn Jones with me and he always brings it we've got Johnny Whistle back to the train this is the Camp Baker Show hour number two on tonight's Kev Baker Show right here on Truth Frequency Radio www.tfrlive.com don't forget Kev Baker Show, sponsored by Get The Tea. So you know what I like to say. Head on over there. Check out everything they've got to offer over at Get The Tea at getthetea.com. And Ronnie, he'll be back on for his monthly visit on the 15th of this month. So a week tonight, I'll be speaking to Ronnie McMullen. But tonight we have got Ben Emlyn Jones with us here today. And absolutely over the moon, <laughs> Pardon the pun with what we were talking about earlier. Johnny Whistles has joined us as well. Johnny, great to have you back tonight. And I just knew it when I told you Ben's on tonight. I knew you'd make that extra special effort, dude. So really looking forward to the three of us, the three amigos, flying again. Yeah, exactly, Kev. I mean, exactly. Because this is the, the subject, Kev, that me and you live for. You know what I mean? UFOs, stuff like that. Um, this is the good and, stuff, Johnny. Yeah, and... To have Ben, uh, he's a perfect man to talk it with. So, fantastic. I was listening uh, about both of you talking about the moon there. And NASA, uh, sorry, NASA, the Chinese have not real, released anything. All they've released is maybe a picture of it actually just as it first takes off on it, its mission. Uh, but it'll be quite interesting to see what just comes back, back from the Chinese, Kev. And that's what they're telling us. You know, they've probably got a live stream going with that probe they've got around the moon. I, I know what you're saying exactly, Johnny. But I imagine that that one they released us, I'm sure it would have kept on sending a few more back that we haven't seen yet. And I get in the, the kind of sci-fi guy in me. It really wants to have evidence of these moon bases and things, Johnny. It really, really does. And then that would lend a lot of credence to a story that we all kind of believe something very, very kind of otherworldly took place here in the UK, is Rendlesham Forest, right? 
And of course, Rendlesham Forest, the most famous UFO case over here. It's our Roswell, Ben. And we are good friends with the, the team over at UFO Truth magazine. We've got Tino and we've got the brilliant Gary Heseltine, who we've both spoke to many times. And there is a new documentary coming out soon that they have both been very, very instrumental in. It's called Capel Green. And I find it very interesting that we've got a new angle to the whole Rendlesham Forest story just ahead of its release. Oh yeah, that's right. It's um, this is really quite extraordinary. This came out just after Christmas, um, and it came from a, a person called Dr. David Clark, who is very much a media pundit in Britain when it comes to UFOs. He is a professor at uh, Sheffield Hallam University in the subject of folklore, and he's become a kind of like a know-it-all pundit sort of person related to the uh, UFO subject. He's the guy every TV network has on speed dial when you have a UFO story that comes into the, into the newsroom. And um, he released um, a, a blog article, which led to a number of uh, news reports. In fact, it, it led to um, a story that was repeated in almost every newspaper in the entire media. It's incredible. It went viral. And this is a, a, poss- a supposed explanation for the Randallshire Forest incident on top of the lighthouse and the joyriding ice cream van, and the truckload of burning manure, and all the other things. And this was apparently, um, he'd heard from a guy he met in the pub, I think, Clark, that um, that it was a prank, it was a joke. It was a prank played on the US Air Force security police by British Special Forces. Uh, What had happened was that uh, apparently beforehand um, there'd been some kind of incident in which um, the US Air Force had captured and interrogated some members of the uh, SAS, Special Air Service, the uh, elite special forces in Britain, and um, there was some kind of desire for revenge. They pulled off a a stunt which involved all faking all the things that uh, the witnesses reported. Now, um, it's you, you just have to look through this for a moment and you can see that it is palpable nonsense. It's completely inconceivable that this would ever happen. And I mean, um, even anyone who's who knows anything about this sort of thing. I mean, I was I was only in the Royal Navy for four months. I'm not an expert on this, but I mean, I know obviously Larry Warren and people like that who've actually got more expertise in this area and it actually was went through advanced training in, in security police. That the idea that something like this would ever be done on an active nuclear base with with security guards who were armed with live ammunition is absurd. This is it was, it's the most incredibly reckless thing imaginable. And there's absolutely no way that it could possibly happen. I mean, people could get shot. I mean, Larry Warren and these other guys, Larry and the other, these other guys were telling us about that. They told me and Gary and Tino about their training in the course of, it all comes out in this film, Capel Green. They were, this is why the UFOs were such a shock. And they weren't, they weren't expecting it because they were expecting Russian special forces on hang gliders and parachutes to land on the base. Now, if that happened, they'd immediately open fire on these guys. Now it's the, um, Anyone who tried to think think you could play a prank with people like that is taking their lives in their hands. Well, and like, be- exactly. And I, I can really testify to this, right? Because I've done guard at military bases. Now, granted, it wasn't the height of the Cold War, nor did we have nukes on there. But that doesn't take away from the fact that when you were on guard duty, if you had seen an incident involving a craft landing, strange lights, and potentially beings getting out of it, You wouldn't have got close enough to make out the shape of those beings because I would have been opening up big time because that would have been deemed as some kind of attack. And you put yourself back to that time set, 1980, when it was the height of the Cold War. And it's not nothing like Dad's Army or something like that, folks. It's not a Monty Python base. Like Ben says here, these guys would have been armed and they would have been absolutely on alert for something just like this. So that's yeah. why it makes it ridiculous, Ben, because as good as the SAS are, uh, and I, I was fortunate enough to, you know, have a conversation with one of them. Uh, he looked like some kind of little ninja. He wasn't even any bigger than me, which made yeah. them even more scary. You know, you just wouldn't take a risk like that, Ben. Absolutely it's, not. Yeah, I mean, Larry, Larry had to go through over a year of training before he actually uh, was allowed on active duty. And he... This it's is all anyone, but anyone, everyone who actually knows about this sort of thing has said the same thing that what Clark is suggesting is utter 
built boulder dash and not only that it's not just a silly story that's got through into the media by accident this i don't think it's possible that uh, this story would have gone so far if it was just some kind of harmless frolic some piece of frivolity the very fact that it's been so widely spread means that it's serving some kind of purpose and it's as the light just with the lighthouse just with the manure and just like with the ice cream van and all the other things that have been talked about to try and explain this Rendlesham Forest incident as something that is not mysterious and not extraterrestrial it's confusing and it's distorting the information that's coming out it's it's making the incident look like a joke and it is hoping to distract people and to discourage them from investigating further and that's for, the timing is rather apt because in a couple of months uh, a new film is going to come out probably the most important Randallsham Forest documentary of all time Capel Green and I think the people behind the secrets of Randallsham Forest know this is coming and they're worried and they want to get their disinformation in first they want to muddy the waters beforehand so that so when the film is released it won't have any fertile ground to grow and that's uh, that's the challenge we've got to face is to what we're doing now is talking about this diffusing the nonsense i made a video about this it's a ridiculous story and so uh, hopefully the the truth will win out over this in the end kev that's what i hope absolutely and before you know i, I give my thoughts on it johnny let me come to you man rendlesham forest the sas what are you making of this dude absolute nonsense kev do you know what I mean? This, as you say, the, the time of the risk, it, it really stinks, to be to be honest with you. And it, it's another one that's just that's trying to put down this Rendlesham thing. And I don't know why they're doing it, because there's too many people know about it. There's too many people saw it. And why they would uh, try and poo-poo this, it, it, it's just beyond me, to be honest with you. Absolutely. Absolutely, John. And, you know, back to you, Ben. This isn't, in my opinion, just a, a single event because when it comes to muddying these waters ahead of this coming out, it might not have directly started because of Capel Green, this next thing I'm going to bring up, but it's certainly been convenient and, like you say, confusing people. And the ufology kind of scene over here in the UK, as we spoke about before, has been really, really ripped down the middle and turned really nasty and toxic over this one case and over somebody that we both regard as a friend, somebody we've both had on the show, Larry Warren. So people who are maybe not as well versed in things as we may be, or the audience may be, like you say, they've been confused by watching all of this on social media, the kind of viciousness, the violence at times that's been threatened by people. And this story coming now hot on the heels of it, I mean, it just adds to a perfect kind of way to at least keep people guessing, keep them thinking. Because like you say, Capel Green has got the potential to be the best, certainly the highest produced kind of production value documentary on this event. I think so, yeah. I'm really looking forward to its release. Uh, there's a, there's a, as you said, there's a massive backlash against it, which is part of this, this division and this conflict that's going on in the, in the UFO community and has been now for almost three years. But it's it's all... And it's what's the shame, the shame or the what is really frustrating about it is it's all inspired by a, a personal issue with with Larry, and it's got nothing to do with anything ufological at all, mm. which is very very sad indeed. And I do hope that people will be able to see through the uh, the, dis, the dis, it's not disinformation because it doesn't serve, it's not created for the purpose of disinforming. It's just a, as I say, it's to do with personal animosity. But I do hope people will see through it and they'll be able to watch this film and realise the truth behind what's really been going on all this time. And um, it's, I think there has to be a point where the, the you essentially hit a critical, critical mass. I don't believe secrets can be kept forever. I don't believe the keepers of the truth embargo, as Stephen Bassett calls it, they don't have everything their way. They are not perfect. They're not gods. They they make mistakes, and they have errors, and they have to fall back at times. And um, hopefully a film like Capel Green will drive them back. And it's, it's a film which is already enormously controversial, and believe it or not, some reviews of the film have already been published – by people who've never even seen it. And that's got to be a first in the history of cinema. Um, so, um, but please uh, don't believe the hype, everyone. Wait until May. It's coming out on the 1st of May. Watch the movie. Make your own minds up, because I'm confident that you'll make your mind up the right way. Even the trailers alone, they look absolutely Hollywood style. You can't really say any any less than that. And 
Uh, again, Gary, we've both spoke to Gary, Gary Heseltine. He's an ex-policeman, and he gets excited. That you can tell he's passionate about this topic anyway. Before Capel Green, and when you hear him talk about how excited he is about this documentary coming out, that in itself is enough for me to tell me this is going to be absolutely mind-blowing. Yeah, the, Gary is, um, as you say, he's an ex-policeman and he's t- he put his powers of deduction because he was a detective for many, many years into the UFO field. This is why he's the lead researcher for Capel Green. This is how he's got all this new evidence together. He's managed to get the new witnesses to testify. People like Steve Longero, who's already come out and he's testified. There's a couple more coming out. He's got these various people who who have been interviewed, <coughs> excuse me, including myself. I myself have been interviewed for the film and um, hopefully it will be in the in the a theatrical cut but really it's the, it's the actual witnesses themselves Larry Warren and his colleagues who, who saw that and, and now and are speaking out about it they're the, they are the stars of the show they are the, it's the, the extra evidence associated with this the polygraph test the new documents these are I think are going to be the deal breakers in this situation so um, onwards and upwards and I say like I said the, the keepers of the truth embargo their luck can't last forever their nine lives are going to run out and uh, hopefully Cable Green will be the ninth the SAS, indeed. Yes, absolutely. We'll keep you up to date with all the the other stories that are bound to come out in the weeks ahead leading up to that release, because take my word for it, folks, there's going to be more. But, you know, aside from Rendlesham then, Ben, and I may have asked you this before, but if somebody was to look at UFO cases here in the UK, take Rendlesham out of the equation, what's the most interesting one for you after that personally? Well, there's a, there's a number, of, I must say. I mean, obviously, I think Rendlesham is the tops. Well, but there are a lot thing about Britain, isn't it? I mean, we hear about Rendlesham, and we're guilty of it as anyone. We speak about this one so much, guys. And what other stories are there? Because we hear a lot coming from around the world, but yeah. just Rendlesham here. And Britain, I think Britain actually does seem to be the... Uh, the have In terms of UFOs, indeed paranormal in general, it seems to be the abs... The pinnacle it seems to have the most of any country on earth so we've got more than our fair share there's a vast number of really really interesting cases involving uh, landings uh aliens abductions um there's particularly the um well there's a couple spring to mind particularly the uh, penturk incident which is very interesting now this took place is actually very what's interesting about this is it's very recent it's uh, actually only three years and um, the witnesses still around, they're talking. There's a lot of research was done on the time. And this is an incident when which a strange object appeared in the sky in South Wales. And um, it was accompanied by a lot of attention from the government. There were planes circling. There were strange people on the ground who claimed to be from Vodafone. Although they were carrying weapons, they were they were tooled up with rifles and they had guard dogs and things like that. Um, all kinds of strange things associated with that. There's the strange case of uh, Mrs. Jessie Rustenberg, who was a farmer's wife from, I believe, from Shropshire, who... Um, was just in a house one day and she heard a strange noise outside. She stepped outside, she looked up. There was a flying saucer above the roof of her house. It was just literally almost, it almost landed on the roof and she looked up and there was these two Nordics in this sort of uh, blister cockpit looking down at her. Oh, that's the ones I want when I have my experience. I don't want no insect-looking ones coming down. Give me a couple of blondes any day. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Was, yeah, she she did say they were beautiful people, and they were staring at her, and they were very human-like. And this cross shot disappeared virtually, and it was flying around the the uh, the house, and it just shot up into the sky. And um, she's very. I mean, she was first interviewed in the late 70s about an incident that actually happened in the 1950s. But she was interviewed many, many other times in her life. She died a couple of years ago. She never changed her story. And every investigator said she was absolutely one of the most trustworthy and sincere people they've ever had. Her interview, her testimony has been, has been analysed by all kinds of experts in um, witness um, lie detection and things like that. And they said she's telling the truth. Oh, I love this, kid. This is why I love when you come on, Ben. This is like when I was like younger, like a child, and it'd be like a winter's night. And Johnny, remember when you were like young and like your granny or somebody would be telling all these stories and things? Ben just knows all of these things off the top of his head. And it, sometimes you forget you're on a show, right? It's like you're sitting there hanging off. It was brilliant, dude, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I'm, such a, I'm such an anorak, aren't I? Yeah. No, not at all. <laughs> like myself and Johnny say, right, Johnny, this is the kind of thing if we were nowhere near the, the internet having a radio show, anything like that, if we're hooking up, we're going to be talking about this anyway, right? 
Yeah, we'd be sitting on top of a hill somewhere doing this, Kev. Absolutely, man, because this is the good stuff. And, Johnny, I was mentioning the Nordics there. Knowing my luck, I'll be waiting for the kind of door to go down. It'll be Nordics, all right, but it'll be a couple of Vikings with hammers or something. <laughs> I know. Yeah, <laughs> you, I know. I'll get, definitely, I'll get a grey. I know all about <laughs> I'll get a probably a lizard probably, but um, aside from Rendlesham, Johnny, what's your kind of UFO case to go to? UFOs. Well, actually, there was one today. I was watching it uh, again. I've been watching all the UFO stuff. It's been nice, nice there. man. And again, it was a uh, one. I mean, I can't even remember what it is because my brain's frazzled. But uh, you probably remember it, that the, the guy was fishing and this thing came over the top. It made a big green light in the background. Then there was all sorts of helicopters and things. But the, everybody that is in that place where it, it, it took place, anybody that mentions it, there seems to be black SUVs turn up and start watching them and start following them and things. As soon as anybody starts talking about it, and I don't know what it, I don't know what this thing was. It was a cylindrical, and it was it was actually tumbling. And when they when they visited the place, I mean, half the trees, I mean, they still to this day the tops are missing from it. There was a they sent the army who took two two days to retrieve any parts of this thing and put it on the back of a truck, covered it in the the tarp and then took it off to some base uh, because there's three military bases that's right next to this thing and for some reason they've stopped, Kev, everything. All the flights that's over that place. Now they said that this had been going on for months and months. The flights, helicopters... Every single day, and then all of a sudden, nothing. No UFOs, no planes, and no helicopters. Pretty weird. Oh, 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 very weird. Ben, I'm not sure if you know what exact case that was, but you hear about this, right? These these kind of events where people see something, and then you've got this military presence, almost like they've spotted it coming in maybe, they've been waiting for it. The two are certainly connected, and these cases where Johnny's saying there, you know, the place cleared out, uh, that's a weird one, dude. Yeah, and it's, it seems that this happens every time, and, it's this, and it doesn't matter what part of the world you're in. The same thing tends to happen. It's as if there's a global policy in place for dealing with this subject, which I think um, comes back to what we were saying about China landing on the moon. Because we were saying, well, it's it's another country. Surely they might have, uh, they may see things that they don't want to keep secret, even if the Americans do. Well, I think it's unlikely when you consider the uh, response to the crash, the, uh, the crashes and the landings, the crash retrievals and things like that. For example, what happened in Penturk is very similar to what happened at Roswell, which is very similar to what happened um, at uh, the uh, the Virginia incident in Brazil, and indeed the um, there was an incident in. Um, in Gateshead in um, in 1940, and then you come back to 1989, there was the event in South Africa, in um, all kinds of ser- the, the Kalahari incident. They, the government move in, they they seal off the area, they get the police in and the and the armed forces, and they seal and they basically they keep everyone away. They get rid of all the decisive evidence, and they come up with some cock and bull cover story about what really happened. That happens every single time. And then anyone who's a witness, anyone who's involved, who has uh, knowledge which they shouldn't, uh, you get like, uh, they get visits from the government. They also get like strange things happening to them. Like, um, for example, um, there's no doubt that people who have these kinds of experiences, it changes their lives. And indeed, one of the witnesses to the Pentech instance has reported you know, she's having thoughts and feelings she never had before you know, as a result of being involved in this. And um, yeah, sometimes she's not the- dreaming about blue chickens. Oh, God. <laughs> I think now he's just Corey Good, <laughs> but you know the um, the Men in Black, the mysterious Men in Black appear, and this seems to happen to all kinds of people, including Jim Templeton, who um, Jim Templeton took a photograph of his daughter in Cumbria in in 1965. This was, and um, he, there was an alien in the photograph. You could actually see it behind the, the little kid's head, and a little bit later on, he was visited by these mysterious Men in Black, and this was at a time before Men in Black were part of popular culture 
This is before John Keel started talking about them. This is before Nick Redfern started talking about them. And so what they are, I don't know where they come from, but they're somehow, I used to think they were sort of government agents, but now I think they're more likely to be connected to the aliens themselves. It's something weird is going on. Very, very weird going on with this planet. We're not alone. We are being interacted with by a non-human intelligence, by an extra, there was an extraterrestrial presence engaging the earth, engaging the human race. And, um, obviously there are people in authorities who know more about this than the general population and they want to keep it that way. They don't want this knowledge being given out to the general population. And I think that's um, something that I think is one of our challenges is to, to actually uh, change that situation and to make it, uh, these, ev- give everyone, because I think everyone has a right to know and a need to know. Absolutely. And Johnny, you've even dropped in the chat here. I mean, what were they doing? Because they had to cut, like build a road to get to this thing. Yeah, they had to add to the road. They had to uh, make the road wider because the structures that they had, they were they were too big actually to get into this tiny wee road that would take them into the woods. So even that part is still there. But again, nobody will make any official comment about it. I wish we had the I wish we had the Wookie with us tonight. I'm sure he would have given us his thoughts on what was going on with that one. But no, folks, this is all joking aside. I mean, I don't need to tell everyone out there who's listened to any of me before that I'm a believer that there certainly are otherworldly things visiting us and people are seeing them. I also have to accept the fact that, and I'm sure the guys would agree, a lot of the stuff that is unexplained doesn't necessarily mean it comes from another world. It might not be those Nordics that I keep on talking about. But it could literally be stuff of our own making, our own technology, be it secret programs from down here on planet Earth or or like Gary McKinnon was talking about with the off-world kind of element to all of this. The kind of tamer end of the secret space program narratives that you hear all over the internet. Who honestly knows Johnny Whistles, but I can guarantee this is a topic that we will always be covering, right? Oh, definitely. Okay. This is one of the things that will never, ever go away. Uh, what I mean, I would well, love to have seen what Gary actually seen, Kev. Absolutely right. And you're a Templar. We always make make a bit of a joke about you being called Johnny Sinclair, right? Mm-hmm. So we talk about all these UFO signs, but tonight we haven't mentioned the seas. And of course, the Templars very kind of a uh, sea worthy, shall we say, Johnny? But what's your knowledge of underwater bases, man? Because I know you're in the know. You've been read in. <laughs> I, I, I wish I was, Kev. How's the but, Aqua Temple doing? Um, it's there's a leak in it just now. I had to close it for a wee while. But no, I mean, it, Kev, as you said, the USO. Do you know, I mean, it, this isn't a thing that was even goes back to like the early fifties, uh, forties, thirties. This goes right back to the days of Columbus when well, he was off his lights in the water. Yes, you know like what, what myself and Ben said as well, the far side of the moon, what a perfect place to hide something because, well, nobody's going to be going there anytime soon. And that works for the ocean as well. Not many of us are going down to the bottom of the Mariana Trench anytime soon, Johnny, are we? So no, we're works. not, Kevin. Yeah. The thing is, they know we're not looking down there anyway, so... Precisely, we Johnny. We explode 5% of it, so... And we talked about the Chinese space station that came crashing down to Earth and how it hit the water. That's because there's more water than land, folks. It's a perfect place to hide. We'll be back after the break and have got another interesting story about the temple. Johnny, you're going to love it. Ben Emlyn Jones, our special guest. Be right back. <laughs> Right here on Truth Frequency Radio. Remember, over on Facebook, Facebook as I like to call it, Twitter as well, wherever you can share the word about TFR, please, please, please do so. Tell them all to tune in to tfrlive.com. So, again, it's with heavy heart I move into the final segment tonight. Johnny, I want to come back to you quickly because this will really set us off in a good direction. And we often talk about the Knights Templars, and I've got that really, really kind of cool Photoshop of you that I'm looking at right now that <laughs> uses your Skype ID, right? And you've got the full Knights regalia on, you've got the chain mail, the Red Cross. And just recently, over the Christmas period, I always FaceTime or Facebook Messenger with my mum. We're always chatting away. And of course, my stepdad was off, right? 
And I've often talked about Oak Island, that program, and of course the Templar connection to that. So I bring up the fact that the new season started. And then one day speaking to my mum and my stepdad was there, he kind of chimes in. You know, I woke up late last night, had that horrible cold. And he got up out of bed in the middle of the night. And Oak Island, one of the pre- the kind of start of the new season and previous episodes, were on Johnny, right? And he says, you know, I don't know if I've told you before, but I- I'm actually related to the Sinclairs. <laughs> and Frank was telling me, and a big shout out to Frank and my mum, he, he, we got into a little conversation about this. He was really into Oak Island, the programme, the hunt for the treasure there. And he said, you know... It, from what he knows, the Sinclairs that he's connected to, they were up in the Orkney Islands at the north of Scotland, or, or just off the coast, sorry, anyway. And then what they went from there was on a mission, on a voyage across the Atlantic. And guess where they landed, Johnny? Nova Scotia, dude. Oh. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, we speak about, you know, the potential for the Knights Templar being at Oak Island at some point. And there are, there's various kind of theories as to who was there, Johnny. But here's Frank sitting telling me, nonchalantly, after all this time, <laughs> catches a rare episode of Oak Island through the night and lays that bombshell on me. You know, I couldn't have had a better Christmas present, John. That's amazing, isn't it? No half, to be honest with you, Kev. I mean, that's quite cool. How is it he's connected, do you know? Now, I'll need to, uh, my mum, she probably will be listening. If not, I can certainly message her. But I was that kind of flabbergasted and taken aback. I was just sitting there, my jaw was kind of hanging open. I was trying not to catch flies because I was so shocked. So I'll (laughs) need to get them to really go over it again. But yeah, you could have knocked me over with a feather, John. I was amazed. And of course, with your connection as well, it's just another synchronicity, bro. Yeah, I don't know. Do you know the thing, a, a, a weird thing as well, Kev, is uh, my granddad, uh, the single one that I never ever met, but his his wife was a, a native Indian and she stayed in Canada. Uh, that's Nova Scotia, isn't it? Um, she stayed in Canada in a, an Indian reservation, Kev. Um, I don't know. I don't know if, if I don't know how far the the single bloodline goes back because we can't really f- find anything after the if, Indian. If, if you're so, anything to go by, John, a long way. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> uh, but no, man, the Knights Templar, fascinating, Ben. And, you know, it might not hold much bearing to all the things going on in the world today, but it's certainly a subject that holds so much intrigue, such really important characters in the historical timeline, right? Yeah, and it's, it does still influence the uh, the world today, I think, because uh, a lot of the societies that uh, were created by the Templars and descended from the Templars are still funny active handshake. in the world today. Yeah, funny handshakes, lodges. Yeah, like that. Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. There's a book called Born in Blood, which traces the origins of the Scottish Rite from the Knights Templars direct. What's interesting is you you mentioned Nova Scotia, which means New Scotland, interestingly. Yep. Yep, yep. And um, this after the the purge in France, a lot of the Templars fled to Scotland, and some of them went to uh, North America. Now this was a, a continent which apparently no one knew existed at the time. It was till two hundred years before it was officially discovered by Christopher Columbus. But mm-hmm. that's absolute nonsense, absolute nonsense, totally. <coughs> there was yeah, some... I mean, you mentioned, I mean, when I was in Canada, and I say when I was in Canada, I spent a grand total of two days there, not even that, 24 hours over two days, because on the way to America, we, we stayed there overnight. <laughs> on the way back from America, we stayed there overnight when I was in the army, right? But we stayed in Halifax, and it's the main place in Nova Scotia. And this place, Ben, with the street we stayed on, guys, it was all salt tires and the, the, the rampant lion, Johnny. It looked like it was almost like it had gone through a portal and had landed back in the Highlands somewhere. So they're very, very proud of those Scottish roots and Scottish connections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think yeah, yeah. As you said, the Americans they, they do love the Scottish connections. Or the Canadians. Yeah, or Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. I mean, we've got a lot of people stay there, Kev, that are. 
Scots. There's a lot of towns in America and especially in uh, Canada that are named after Scottish uh, towns. Do you yep. know what I mean? There's all sorts. So. Florida. I've seen a Florida in Inverness. Uh, sorry, an in Inverness in Florida. Yeah. Trust me, the Inverness I'm closer to, Johnny, not, looks nothing like Florida. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. Absolutely. And, you know, Ben, when you think about the Templars as well, one thing that obviously springs to mind is Roslyn Chapel. Oh, yeah. And that place in itself, Johnny was there not long ago. Great photograph it's, of the place. And it, it's encoded with messages that we don't know to this day. I've got to go there. I've really got to go there one day. It's fantastic. And it's like um, Brian um, Brian Allen has been studying it and he's, he's found portals and things there. And it's true because... It's not just all well, that place is fascinating, but even better known places. Because, for example, if you think of the Middle Ages, we always think of it as being very backward. They were they were burning witches at the stakes. People had hand carts. They were farming by hand. They lived very simple lives. But at the same time, these cathedrals were being built. These amazing structures, which are far more than just big churches. They're much more than that. Uh, they they uh, were built sort of around about the ninth, tenth century, eleventh century time almost a thousand years ago now, and um, they still dominate the skylines of our cities today. Most of them are still standing, and um, they have in within them sacred geometry. For example, they have the, the, the fee portion, the golden section, encoded into the architecture, which is why music sounds very good in there. The acoustics are so uh, fine, and this is why a lot of the choirs and things get recorded in these big cathedrals. And um, you've got to ask yourself, a, a, a primitive culture could not build those things. The, the people like the Freemasons and the, and the people behind this, which, de- which goes back to this ancient stream of knowledge, actually designed and built these structures. And um, they're still there today. You can go and visit them. They're, they're, all, they're dotted all over Europe and you can go and visit them. And it's a, it's a testimony to the strangeness and the mystery of the past and, and the, the secret stream of knowledge compared to the public stream of knowledge, which is not unlike the UFO issue that we were talking about before on the secret basis. There's the, the general population, the rabble, uh, what we're allowed to know. And then there's the uh, the elite um, in knowledge, the, those who are enlightened, which literally means Illuminati. I it's what they point, know. Yeah, I make that point all the time because you get like your first thir- three degrees and probably everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people listening to this show they're going to know somebody that's a Freemason. Now, that doesn't mean that they've all got some hidden conspiracy or playing a part in taking over the world and some of the shadier stuff we hear. But like you say, because of the structure of it, there are that elite kind of groups within Freemasonry that are certainly higher up the ladder, higher up the degrees. And again, compartmentalization is really the only the really top echelon that ever get to know the full picture, I imagine. Even then, do they get the full picture? I was watching a documentary recently, and this was fascinating, and it was going back to the time of the pyramids, believe it or not. And they were saying that when they built the pyramids, they were literally paying homage. Well, they were literally the first ones to be talking about squaring the circle. And, of course, squaring the circle is something that is very, very central to Freemasonry, right? Because you get that on all of the kind of, I think it's the third degree, the kind of, picture that goes with it Uh, and this is you know almost the freemasons looking back to the original builders there and the the kind of work that still remains to this day over in egypt and giza on the plateau so it goes all the way back to there so you have to wonder where did this kind of information that they have hidden over the ages where did it come from initially Exactly. I mean, it's a, that's a good point. Where where did it come from? It certainly didn't emerge from the culture with which these these secret societies and the people within them existed. Because as I remember, as you as we were saying, while they were building cathedrals, at the same time the common people couldn't even read, and they were burning witches at the stake, and they and they were superstitious, and they they farmed with 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 hand tools and things like that. Um, same with ancient Egypt. I mean, the pyramids are the, the Great Pyramid, in particular, is one of the most incredible structures ever built. It's, it's, it's the they, how these big stones got put in place, how they were so precise, far more precise than any modern architect ever needs to be. Well, um, and arguably, right? The, the modern cathedral <clears throat> and the really the, the ones, the ones that you're kind of talking about previously, guys. You compare them to the buildings around them today. And hypothetically, you move forward in time anywhere towards 500 years from now, 
they could theoretically still well be standing and still looking like they do today, just like the pyramids have kind of survived over time as well. I think they probably will outlive, outlast many of the buildings yeah, that exist today. Absolutely. Indeed, in fact, they have built outlived most of the buildings that were there before them, and that's because they were so so expertly constructed. So did this come from the ancient world? Is it knowledge that was channeled in some way through um, some kind of spiritual practice, maybe Luciferian um, maybe Luciferian initiation? Is there knowledge from beyond this world which a high initiated Freemasonry can access? And as you said, like, is high initiates. I mean, there's, there's plenty of free, there's millions of Freemasons in the world. One of the porters at my hospital was a Freemason. I used to, he was the guy who lent me the book Born in Blood, and he was a great guy. You know, you go. The <laughs> as well for the third degree. Just yeah. have to have a, a star constellation on it, and it's it's the, Pallad- it's the Pallades. So, and that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. So I mean, there's knowledge again from the skies, right? And we yeah. ask the question just moments ago: Where did it come from? Well, maybe a clue might come in the fact that they've got the Pallades as one yeah. of their kind of signs. You know, when many people who have contact with aliens talk about Pleiadians. Now, the yep. Pleiades actually, it's like a star cluster. Um, it's known as the Seven Sisters. There's more than seven stars, but there were seven major ones. And um, they did the thing is a lot of uh, aliens claim to have come from there. And interestingly, um, when it comes to finding out about where this knowledge comes from, a lot of people in the occult world, which of course the Freemasons and the Templars were connected with, talk about how they channel creatures from other worlds. Like Alistair Crowley said that he, he, he drew pictures, actually, of a creature called Lamb, L-A-M, that he was channeling. And the, the picture of Lamb looks very much like a grey. It's got a huge, bulbous head, small eyes, a very, very, a very, very diminutive nose, thin mouth. It looks very much like a, a grey alien. And he has had encounters with this creature. And this creature was, a, was one that gave him knowledge through various spells that he was casting. And I suspect that the uh, the Knights Templar and Freemasons actually used occult knowledge. I think they probably channeled it. They probably got it from um, various spiritual rituals and and um, entities and and intelligences beyond this world actually imparted these into their human minds. This is how they had the knowledge to do what they did. Uh, of course, this this knowledge could be used generally among the entire population. It could be used for good or bad, but um, it's it's always kept by a small elite. You see, we need to be careful here because I think Johnny's just about to phone the, the Templar ninjas to come <laughs> and have a word with us because we're getting close on it here. And, you know, as above, so below, the Freemasons are into a lot of that as well. Again, in my opinion, giving some kind of um, reference to, again, occulted knowledge that came from somewhere. Very, very strange. And something we forgot to bring up, dude, just when we're sitting here talking about secret groups and things, I was going to bring up the Nazis, and of course they were channeling entities, and they were using something like the Thule Society, I think that was the name they went by. And in space, I can't believe we forgot to talk about this, there's been a recent mission, the New Horizons, Ben, to the edge of the solar system, and they've kind of rendezvoused with a space rock out in the Kuiper belt. It looks like a snowman, but interestingly enough, its name is Ultima Thule, or Ultimate Ultima Thule. That's named after the Nazi kind of occult society, dude. Nothing to see yeah. here. It's it's really odd that it's got it's been given this name, isn't, isn't it? it? Isn't it just? And it was given this name before people knew what it looked like. It's what's called a contact binary, which is where basically two objects have like come together and they're sort of stuck together. And um, it's just it doesn't look like a snowman actually, which is strange. But why could the name? I mean, the the Thule Society was like the what, where the Nazis would, were getting their knowledge. But, of course, the Nazis were doing basically what the Knights Templar were doing. And what it meant is when they entered World War II, they had a massive technological advantage on the Allies. And, indeed, they had uh, psychic spies like Sylvia Ortiz. And um, Thule, uh, there's an island called Southern Thule as well, which is um, near the Antarctic, which is a very, very strange place. And it's been, it's come up in several, um, several people have talked about uh, strange things going on there, especially during the Falklands War. Um, it's possible that the entire Falklands War may have been connected, may have actually been in, 
done for that very very reason because there are allegedly aliens living there and uh, that's where the black goo is being mined i mean this is this these are all stories that are going around i don't know how true they are necessarily but it's a very very odd uh, it's very odd that that is also called thule or that southern thule and for some reason they've decided to call this strange object on the edge of the solar system, almost like a little island. It is almost like a little island in the sky. Whoa. And they, you know what I mean? It's this a weird thing, isn't stuff, it? man. It's beyond weird. There's something going on here, dude. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's just too much. It really is too weird. And of course, it, the black goo, that whole kind of line around um, Thule down there in the South Atlantic, it's something that we used to talk about here a lot on the show. And I often say the icing on the cake. It's like the black goo on a show, man. It's not been an absolutely awesome show until you've covered all these many topics and you hit the black goo. But yeah, Thule, do you think I'm just putting two and two together? And it's just a coincidence out of all the words and the, the whole kind of dictionary that they came up with the same name. I know it's it's a figure from ancient Germanic mythology, and um, as you were saying, this is why the Nazis were so interested in it. But it's just it's odd because all the other, well, of course they they've used Greek and Roman mythology for the names of the other planets and various stars. Then they've moved on to other forms of of um, other forms of mythology, but they've been basically going through the South Seas and Polynesia and and um, the American Indians and things like that, such as um, Maki Maki and the Sedna and these various other places. Then they bring in this. I, th- I don't think there's any other, any other Germanic names in the nomenclature of the uh, Kuiper Belt. Yes, yeah, so that's probably the first one. But they've chosen Ultima Thule. I mean, it could be, it could, there could be nothing to it. But I think it's very, very odd. And I'm not saying there's a secret base on there, although there might be. But um, it's, it's almost like it's because it has this fine, kind of slightly humanoid look. I mean, it looks like a snowman, but that, it could easily be. Um, some kind of alien. I don't know. Maybe those, it's a statue. Could it, it be looks, a statue? It could be, and it could also be like a, a fridge spinner. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. Imagine a big statue of like somebody flying through space. Now that would be creepy. But Johnny, yeah. we talked about this when we were on with Nano Girl the last time. You love your space stuff too, dude. I mean, it's still a really cool kind of story that's going on right now, and more and more happening in space these days, right? Or at least they're telling us more about it. Well, they are telling us more. I, I just wonder why they're so interested in this thing, Kev, because just just basically it's, it's a rock. Yeah, exactly, just because they can, Johnny. Don't spend that money investigating the Mariana Trench that we were talking about earlier. Just mm-hmm. throw it out to the Earth cloud, yeah, the Kuiper Belt, you know. Lots to be gleaned from out there, John. I know what you're saying, dude. It's, it's weird. Yeah, it just seems pointless, Kev. That's a lot of money to be thrown do you know what I mean? Where is this thing going to go next? Are they going to be able to send back pictures? Well, it's still going to go further out into into space. And, of course, the, the ne- next nearest object, we're told, is a couple of light years away. So I wouldn't be expecting any dazzling shots, in our, you know, anytime soon, eh? Seems like a right waste right enough, man. Throwing money out the solar system, Ben. Nothing like governments for doing that, right? <laughs> yeah, and I wonder if it has... Um... If it has one of these plaques on it, with which supposedly has encoded messages for the aliens, I, I don't think I don't think New Horizons does. I know that the Voyager and Pioneer spacecraft do, but I mean the thing about it is, it's these things are very all very interesting. But we know there are certain things that if they see them, they won't tell us. They won't let us know. I mean the the Phobos mission in 1989. This was a this was a Russian one. It was about to arrive at the moon Phobos, which is one of the moons of Mars, and you see this strange object appear in front of the camera the next thing you know the whole spacecraft goes down and we never hear from it again and according to the uh, the uh, russian space agency oh it was just a we had a major malfunction it just sort of like crashed on us don't know what to do weird isn't it but it, it happened at that very very moment and you see these things happen in the international space station the space shuttle as well something weird suddenly appears in the sky you even hear the astronauts going oh well, what's that and then suddenly the camera feed goes down so it's all filtered. It's, it's got, ties in with what Donna Hare and Carl Wolf were saying about the, the bases on the moon. Yes, we have a spe- we have a space program. All very interesting. You have some incredible stuff on it, but it's it's there's a there's knowledge that comes from it, but there's also knowledge that is kept back. Um, See, I'd like to... You're going to get me in trouble, dude. We got this far without you really bringing up the Russian space program. 
And now oh. I, just know, I just know my pal, Vladimir. He'll be on the phone later on. He'll be asking me, what are you doing, man? Come on. You need to keep getting <laughs> away from our secret stuff. Chinese, NASA, you, you talk about it all day. All day long till the aliens come home, Kev. But no, no, I can't touch that. You know, my <laughs> Russian uh, Russian agent that I am, Ben. Of course, yeah. Hey, Vlad, just get that IMF loan, all right? Just do as Co- you're told. <laughs> cosmonaut Kev, yes, Cosmonaut Kev. That's what it is, man. But no, we have covered so many topics tonight. And I think a really nice one to take out, one of the things we haven't covered yet that we all like is cryptozoology. And I sent you a story today, and this was referenced, the Tasmanian tiger. Oh, yeah. Of course, is reportedly extinct. Or is it? Is it even real? Well, somebody's gone and seen it, haven't they, Ben? They got a photograph. No, I actually, I actually shared this with Jonathan Downs of the Centre for Fourteen Zoology. I don't know what he thinks of it, but I know his friend Richard Freeman, who I met at the probe conference, has been chasing this thing. He's been trying to find it. <coughs> <coughs> now, this is a creature that lives on Tasmania, which is the uh, big, big southern, the island to the south of Australia. And it's just, so there's some old film of it actually because there was one left in a zoo that died around about 1913. There's some really old film of it. It looks like a dog, but it's actually not a dog. It's a it's a marsupial, so it's more closely related to kangaroos and things like that. But um, it's supposedly, like you say, went extinct. It has these stripes on it that make it look a bit like a tiger as well. But Richard believes it's still alive. And Tasmania is an island the size of Scotland, and it has a quite a small population. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of wilderness there. So it's possible that the populations of the creature still continue to exist in wilderness areas. And Richard has been desperately trying to find it. And I'm sure he'll be very interested in this strange photograph because it's a very clear photograph. You can see it, and you can see that it's a thylacine. It is this Tasmanian tiger. And whether it'll be officially brought back from extinction, I hope so. I hope, and I hope it is, and it's protected so that the ones that are left don't die, because obviously it came close to extinction if, if it didn't actually pass over that limit. You know, they're saying they're getting closer and closer to being able to bring back to life not just animals like that, but how about dinosaurs? Oh, that's a really bright idea, right? Using all the latest advancements in DNA and stuff like that to bring about the dinosaurs. Wouldn't put it past them, though. But there's definitely, you know, all these different animals out there that, like the dodo, like your Tasmanian thing here, that I could make a case for using genetic engineering for, Ben. I mean, if they've got the code there, and I'm not saying we go for the dinosaurs that potential wipe us out, but we could bring some of these animals back in some kind of limited form. And Johnny, you want to jump in here, right? Yeah, it was just about the, the Tasmanian tiger because it was not long ago that they said they were going to uh, re- resurrect that cave because... Maybe that's I mean, what we're saying, John. Yeah, but I, I'm sure that there is still some out there because that, that's one of the things that I've kind of a, not kept my eye on, but it's always interested me, the Tas- Tasmanian tiger. And I'm sure, Kev, I'm sure there's they're still out there somewhere see i reckon the mothman has to go somewhere on holiday and he's got a right taste for tasmanian tigers and i think that's what the kind of the hidden element to the story all is ah, so that's <laughs> why they stay in the woods <laughs> see see no would you come them, yeah. if, if the mothman de- developed a taste for you johnny oh heck no i'd be up in the woods as well hey, you know that some they might nothing bring... on me <laughs> <laughs> There's, there's a possibility they could bring back the mammoth. I mean, they they do have yes. intact mammoth DNA, and yeah. um, they found someone a frozen body, and because some mammoth bodies are actually intact and they're frozen, the flesh is still there, and they've got some actual mammoth DNA intact. It's possible they could clone one. Although, um, I mean, I'd like to see the mammoth come back, and indeed, some people say that, like the Tasmanian tiger, the mammoth still exists in remote parts of Siberia, and I really hope that's the case because it's a wonderful creature. I'd love, I'd love it to still exist. John. Um, uh, Johnny, you just know, right, someone in, in Glasgow somewhere is going to get themselves a woolly mammoth as a pet if they are re-engineered, don't you? You just know one of these schemes somewhere you'll be walking along and there'll be a big woolly mammoth in the back garden, man. Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> and trying to get it in a shed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have had such fun tonight. I really, really have. Uh, it's been a great show. I hope you've all enjoyed it out there. Ben, give your website a shout out and where they can get the book and when they can hear you, etc. Yeah, well, I'm Hospital Porters Against the New World Order, H-P-A-N-W-O, that's Hapanwo 
hyphenvoice.blogspot.com. That's my main news site. There's the YouTube channel. And there's my own shows that I do, like yourself, uh, uh, Thursdays and Sundays and sometimes other days. And, of course, don't forget my books, Roswell Rising, a novel of disclosure, and its two sequels. The trilogy is out. I'm hoping to get it done in a box set, actually, which you can get on Amazon. And um, if you like UFOs and stuff, you'll love those books. So do check those out. It's been good to be on the show. I've got to go and feed the mammoth, so um, <laughs> see you in a bit. <laughs> I'm just taking a pterodactyl over to Johnny's. Well, <laughs> for another night, we are out of time. I love being here for all of you. And wherever you are, make it TFR. It's all Don't you touch that dial. <laughs> <laughs>